Discovery. Welcome to the Podcast Discovery Show, the podcast about other podcasts, where every single week we have a book club style discussion about a podcast, and at the end of the episode, we're going to have a brand new recommendation, and we're going to talk about that one next week. I'm Kirk. I'm Zach. And I'm Matt. And we have a very special guest, longtime friend of the show, amazing content creator, musician, human being, Mr. Billy Mace III, also known as Infinite Third. Hey... So glad you could join us, Billy. Really appreciate it. I to be here. And this week, me. we are going to talk about an NPR show called Invisibilia. Their slug on this is unforeseeable forces control human behavior and shape our ideas, beliefs, and assumptions. Invisibilia, Latin for invisible things, fuses narrative storytelling with science that will make you see your own life differently. And in a, in a funny twist, this episode is all about non-narrative it's all about slow tv it's an episode called the great narrative escape and i really liked the show i had seen slow tv happen and so i wanted to just kind of see how this bounced off everybody like how everybody felt about it and then i was just talking to billy i was like "Uh, billy i want to know how you feel about this too so it just it just worked out perfectly so what did you guys think of this show i guess i'll go first i i had seen that this was a thing like slow TV. I didn't know that it had like an origin of like Norwegian uh, slow TV, which like they said, there's been other similar things, but the fact that they did something on actual TV for like, how long was it? It was one of them was five days, right? The yeah, It was days uninterrupted, no commercials mm-hmm. <laughs> and that they got the most viewing over any sporting event and, and, and anything else. And it just became like this, national phenomenon in Norway. And I thought that part was really cool. So cool. Yeah, no, I, I loved it. I think um, for me, what came to mind is first I've been, I have Apple TV in my living room. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Do you ever see their screensavers and how they like, they'll download new ones every week for you. So you'll see new ones all the time. Yeah. And it's just like things pushing in on like under the ocean or like the great wall of China or mm. a city. And I put that on all the time and I'm just like, this is perfect. Like while I play with my daughter or something like that, but the slow TV thing kind of takes the immersion a little bit further. And I was like, well, that is the next step of this. Like I need to just start putting this on full screen on my TV and just kind of like letting it be there. Yeah. And I, I remember this becoming kind of a thing. I can't, I must've been around when this, when the, the boat trip was happening or something. I just remember hearing about it. Slow TV bunch of train videos. That's really the vast majority of what we're seeing is a train driving through Norway and it's forever long, but it's very relaxing. And it, it, to me, it's kind of, I use it more as white noise. Like, cause in the episode they're talking a lot about like between the hosts, they're talking about, by the way, I should say the host name, Abby Shaw is the producer, Kia Miyaka Natisse and Yowei Shaw are all three on this show. And they talk a lot about kind of how they, interact with their media because there's a lot in this episode about Americans maybe not being mentally ready for slow TV, (laughs) not being able to handle in general. And honestly, I kind of agree with that. You know, Mm -hmm. if you look at, honestly, you can look at like American versions of European shows and you're like, Oh, okay. I see. uh, There's a difference here. And so it did make me think about that, but they were just talking about kind of how narrative hits them differently. And then you go to a a slow TV show that's literally, it's just a train. And so for me, I couldn't sit there and like be dialed in Mm -hmm. watching this for 12 hours at a time, but as like kind of a background thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's it's, it's white noise. It's the white noise machine. It's the, it's ambient stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I loved how they, how they framed it as slow TV forces you to make a decision, how you interact with it. You know, like you watch a narrative show, if you miss a line, like you could just be totally out of the loop or whatever. You miss a minute of a narrative show. It's like you're gone. But with this, you can like, you can decide to just make it a part of your day. You can watch the whole thing if you want. And I happen to, I happen to disagree. I think that American audiences really would be into this. 
because I think everything's so, and they talked about this briefly, everything's so fast and so complicated in American TV and movies that like, it is, it's like a narrative escape. Mm -hmm. But, but I also feel like it would have to be framed in a way where it's like, this is, it's, this is, watch it. Because you might see something happen, you know. I do think they it, have the to trick that way. Yeah, well, I thought <laughs> like, that was the flaw with what um, they were presenting it as for bringing it to America. Of yeah. like, we're going to put it in prime time or something, and like do it on Thanksgiving, and it'll be from L.A. to San Francisco. And I just thought, why not? Because you can find the slow TV on YouTube, right? For Norway, why not just start an American YouTube and like let it build up that way? Because it's it's like an indie film. They didn't even put in slow indie films on like box or if they do they they speed <laughs> yeah. it up or they have commercial breaks you know and i and i was thinking the same thing like i like like i would invite something that is slow that i could like focus on enough and that's why i like slow movies i think yeah. and but there's also that adrenaline rush from a fast movie or a fast show where you have to watch the next episode because you're so excited your heart's going but like i love a movie that you can just sit in and it's like not much happens but it's like a vibe and yeah, you can focus on it though. I really do like that, I, and, and I feel like it's the same way with music. And mm -hmm. uh, it's it really is just kind of I hit different vibes, and I want different things out of it. You know, it's not that I don't like one or I do like the other, and it's mutually exclusive. I I like both because there's a lot of times where I want some ambient music when I'm just working on something or trying to relax. And there's sometimes where it's great to hear somebody who can really draw a story through their music, you know, and you can also do that without lyrics. You know, it's, it's, it's so interesting to kind of think the way that they were thinking and you can hear kind of like a change in how they're thinking after they kind of watch mm -hmm. some of the slow TV mm -hmm. and see what's happening. They're like, wait, what, am I missing something here? <laughs> you know, I think they had to kind of like question like, okay, why is this popular? Why is this such a, such a thing? What, what am I supposed to be seeing? Well, like, oh, the windshield wipers are on now. Something yeah. happened. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's exciting. And <laughs> something that I also don't think that they really touched on, but like these slow TV things and slow media in general has no point of view typically. Like, so it puts you there well they did they did mention the part about um kennedy's funeral mm -hmm. um right. where it was like it's apolitical it's like you the viewer may have something that they feel about it like they didn't agree with them and they're mad that people are mourning right. or they did agree with them and they're sad but it's just being presented as look this is what's happening americans are mourning as the car passes and you're like in the thing with it's what them. the viewer brings to it rather yeah. than what the producer is trying to impose on the viewer mm -hmm. it's and so honestly it's so like impressive to be able to do that to shift the mindset because honestly i would i would say that you kind of do the same thing with an ambient music because they leave space for your mind to kind of go places you know you're not trying to follow any written word or anything like that you're just kind of in a space and so it's, it's really interesting to see they did that. And then to hear the Norwegian production guy be like, it's not art or anything. We're just like, we're telling a story where like, it's like, I, yeah. I don't know about that. It's pretty awesome what you guys have done. He was kind of a little bit like very like on his high horse about this thing. Like I, mm -hmm. I agree with him that he like, he's crushing it with presenting this thing. But I felt like whatever anyone presented about what it is, he's like, no, it's not quite that. He's like, it's, you don't understand. Like, yeah. And it's, and I just felt like, it is, it's obviously art. Like, I mean, it's, it's, it's actually his art. Like, and then when they revealed that, like, it was his, like, he took that boat when he was a child. So it had this special place in his heart. Right. Wasn't that what they said? And like, then you realize, oh, this like literally is like his documentary and it's his style. It's like, mm -hmm. I'm just going to plop you in the place where I was and you're going to enjoy it. Like I did. And, and, I thought that was like, and then he's but, literally the one that's like, it's not art. It's, yeah. it's, it's, we're just going, we're just on a <laughs> right. boat. Question. Did any of you guys watch very much of it? I didn't watch very much of it. I've definitely seen some, but um, go ahead and tell everybody how much well, of it no, you just, watch. I was just asking. <laughs> just, okay, because it was funny. It right now, yeah. Yeah. You don't. I, I would just look. I had it on for a long time. He check. literally did check. Just when you really, said that, he checked over. He's like, am I? No, no. Just don't. Just so, don't. Tell us uh, how literally, it is. When we started, right when we started yeah. recording, I thought the mics were messed up because I was having static, but really it was just because I still had it on and I could hear the ocean. <laughs> I could hear the river. <laughs> um, but um, no, it was, it was interesting because you're talking about this and they would get to certain points 
they had these like locks, like these places where they had to like open a, you know, like a, almost like a, a lock, you know, an, an opening. So the boat would sit there for like 10 minutes and that's where a lot of people would congregate. And it was just funny to, and they would move the camera rather than straight forward. They'd move it to the crowd. And so there's so many people, there was just a million different stories going on at the same time. So that's what was fascinating to me is like, at one point there was these little girls right there near the edge. And first of all, it gave me anxiety because I'm like, don't, I don't like it. No. <laughs> and then you see the yeah. mom like pulling the kid back and then like a worker being like, Hey, your kid's got to be away from that. And, um, the, the first lock that they hit or get to the boat, like, was going too fast and kind of hits it and everybody on the boat's like whoa oh my god <laughs> it's great and um so there's all these like little like the stories. season finale right there <laughs> <laughs> there's all these like little like you said stories going on and different people are going to see different things there was an area where like a bunch of kids were like jumping in the water right before the boat and um <laughs> and one of the places they stopped at same thing with like a lock it was a bunch of old people square dancing. <laughs> it was so good to like live music. That's it was so like funny. Wow. So funny and great. Well, this and episode. I, go ahead, Matt. Oh, I was just because I, I feel like what's so interesting is that in a thing where you're literally just not, where you're presenting everything, where that can be more quote unquote boring or slow than honing in on one tiny thing mm. i just think that's so fascinating because this is like, everyone's gonna see something different right you know what i'm saying they're gonna notice something different at least you well, know also there's no there's no perspective like there's no singular perspective but there's no there's no um emotional manipulation either right. like with music cues or zooms like heavy zooms or something it's mm -hmm. like the, you know these shows and tv and movies are made to do that and to tell you what to feel and this is like literally just people watching or just nature watching and yeah that makes me want to ask you, Billy, what your philosophy is on ambient music. Because I'm well, like, I was, I was actually surprised that they didn't, they didn't really talk about this. I was like, I was listening yeah. to, it, I was like, I was like, surely the word ambient is going to segue <laughs> to ambient music. Or, um, so I, I was very surprised. I thought this was naturally going to go to Brian Eno coining the term ambient music because it was literally. He was in a hospital room and like a tape, the tape player like was left on or something. I don't, I don't know the actual details of the story. Like I haven't told it in a while or heard it in a while, but basically it's, it, it just gave him this idea of composing music that can be equally listened to intently or left on in the background and just like not paid attention to. And that kind of huh. like, that kind of spurred the whole thing. Yeah. That's like exactly what. <laughs> yeah. And I was just like, talks about. it seems like a hole in there. Um, <laughs> in their narrative <laughs> of, uh, you know, like going that direction. It could direction. just be one of those, like they maybe did talk about it and they had to get cut. Yeah. Because they have a time. No, yeah, it, especially it makes, NPR, it you know, this is, yeah. this is a, you know, time thing. And of course I'm them. the musician over there. Like, why are you talking about <laughs> music? <laughs> what is this? <laughs> no, no, I, I made the exact same connection too, though, because that's, that's what this seems like to me is if you watch, okay, if you watch the wire, that's like the dense, there's the whole thing is the narrative. And then if you watch a train for seven hours, that is the polar end of this. So it's like, it, it seems polar the same to me. Yes, yeah, the Polar <laughs> Express. That's the best oh movie. God. That's the one that we need to be referencing. You guys saw that, right? It's horrifying. Animated Tom Hanks was it's, the best. It's not good. <laughs> it's the worst. Yeah, but I it, liked the book. Uh, it's, but it was like a eight page book that they then they tried yeah. to make into a whole movie and it's like no <laughs> I mean there's a problem right there. <laughs> you gotta really expand on some things. But it's it's interesting because I did I I sort of reflected on ambient music and you're probably the you know you're the ambient music guy in my life. <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh but I was like cuz I was kind of thinking about it and you yourself take on a sort of audience perspective by like letting whatever happens happen and mm -hmm. then following that but of course you you are kind of like you know, zooming in on a thing, but then you're like letting it go, which is really well, cool. Well, that's a good, um, cause actually this is, this reminds me of something I thought of during what I was listening to the podcast was, um, I, I think when I was started out, 
I played a lot of noise shows, which is kind of like ambient music, but just where you just bang things, you make electrical errors and stuff like that. And then pe- and some people hear it and they're just like, oh my God, shut that off. <laughs> and I, and I was at first until I started going to these noise festivals and being like, oh, like this is actually meditative. If you realize that everything is making noise around you all the time and you're not like sitting there like, oh, this is out of place. If you know, so th- this is just them saying like, hey, our noise is happening here. Like it's just like everywhere else. Hmm. And it's framed in that way. But what I realized is I was playing those shows and I was sort of like, my sets were really abstract and I, my skills weren't really there, like my confidence. So I would just let it kind of, if it bubbled up to something, that would be awesome. But some sets, it never even would bubble up to something like musical. Hmm. But, and I, and this is what, this is what I thought was like interesting that it came up for me was that as they started talking about narrativity, like the narrativity scale, I think is what they called it. Mm-hmm. Where it's like Disney's way over here. <laughs> and then there's like certain plays and stuff yeah just waiting like, for godot yeah waiting for godot stuff like <laughs> that um are like nothing really happens but it's like a meditation a rumination on things i realize that as i get more skilled and as i i'm doing my streams now and like as i'm trying to like really just push what i'm doing my music is becoming more narrative and i'm letting go of a lot of the um like abstractions which i used to like really linger in the the drone moments, but now I feel like something has happened. And maybe that's like this, maybe that's what they're talking about when they say that um, we have this tendency to want to like push <laughs> the boundaries of narrative and like go to the next thing. Cause like, that's what I'm finding I'm into now is like tying this riff to this riff and then switching it up. And then it's almost like plot twists and stuff. And I'm <laughs> writing a TV show every time I play. <laughs> Cause it's all improvised. So to me that, that was like, that was my version of what they're talking about. It's like, I used to make slow TV and I sort of like grew out of it or maybe I didn't grow out of it. Maybe I like, I sold out in a way because (laughs) I know that it's easier to connect with plots and, you know, relatability and like directing people's gaze, you know, you Hmm. should, you should uh, reframe it as (laughs) you've just become better at finding (laughs) those individual moments within that bigger frame. That's, that's how I think of it is it's like, you can find those two girls that, uh, Kirk was talking about leaning mm-hmm. over the edge mm-hmm. quicker because you've done so much of the slow stuff. Yeah. I guess uh, maybe it's, maybe it's in the way I presented could be, you know, if it's still abstract enough to certain people, cause there's mm-hmm. no words and stuff, they can pick out whatever they want or they can hear it however they want, but I'm still just presenting it as the wider frame. Anyway, yeah. we don't have to do therapy on my. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's oh. awesome. Yeah, but they even talked about slow audio as well. And I didn't know that some of those things existed. Like that, the one where the guy just walks. Yeah. <laughs> I, they I even played it a little bit. Because they brought up ASMR. Yeah. And that was yeah. when the Norwegian guy was like, yeah, those are fine, but they're not like <laughs> slow TV. <laughs> <laughs> the, the man's serious about a slow TV. I'm like, <laughs> eating cheeseburgers in front of a microphone. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, the next episode of Invisibilia is the producer Abby Shaw making her slow podcast. That's, le- that's it? literally really? the next episode. Oh, wow. I thought about okay. doing that, but it makes it a much longer thing <laughs> if we if we did both of them. But yeah, if you want to check that out, the next episode she tries, and I think she was talking to Yoe, and she's like, "You uh, make I'm going to try and make a show that's going to make you listen all the way to the end, even though it's slow." You know, and that's, I guess that was the goal and that's what she went for. So you'll have to listen to the one after this to check now, it out. I, I, and I don't want to get political in any way whatsoever, but <laughs> Whoa, I'm out. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, Abby brought up, you know, when she was talking to the guy that was trying to make the American version, um, the, the problematic things that might go on with, you know, just a trip across the U S but the, the whole thing is like, I understand what she was saying. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I was like, that takes away from the ethos of what slow TV is, you know, that there Mm -hmm. is going to be negative, you know, just like the guy that talked about, you know, waving flags. There was nationalism that made him think about negative things. And there's probably some people that thought about positive things. Mm -hmm. So I feel like there has to be room for people to bring their perceptions to. And that's the whole thing is you're not supposed to be pigeonholing someone into or trying to direct them in any way let them bring their 
Mm-hmm. No, and I mean, we're, we're going to see probably an ugly reflection in the mirror. You know, that's, that's maybe the issue is mm-hmm. like, yeah, I do think there's a chance that happens. If you were to do like a full USA tour, there's going to be some ugly moments, you know, it's going to happen. It's the age of the internet. And there's, there's a lot of stuff happening in this country right now that would generate popularity around going in like photo bombing a thing like this, you know? Yeah. But, it's like moon in the Google car or something, yeah, you know? But, but like I mean, worse. at the same time. <laughs> but racist. Would we be, yeah, would we, would yeah, we benefit from this, Yeah, get there very this, quickly, though? probably. <laughs> you know, do you think that we'd benefit from this? From, like, holding up the mirror and looking? You know, like, because I do think there's a chance that, like, it would help everybody see things differently. You know, and that's, it, I don't know. It's it's hard to tell. I get why she was concerned about it. <laughs> the The guy she was talking to is also, a lot of these guys are very passionate. I think he was a, he was a professor and he was like, no, it's not political. That's not what it is. It's just a thing. It's just a thing. Leave it alone. But it's, I don't know. I do feel like it would be a wild ride to watch this happen in America. Did you, did you notice that one um, quick interview with the psychologist that was like, you know, we kind of just accept that um, faster edits and stories are like making our brains like messing up our brains and it's just like a wily and he's like I see no evidence of that yeah. I don't know I just felt like do you work for NBC or something like that like <laughs> where is it where like I feel like it's something we can intuitively know that like staring at a phone all day isn't good for your brain like your <laughs> your thought processes like I don't know I, I thought that part was like they were trying to say that like they were they were building up that American audiences wouldn't accept it in a lot of ways. But I think what the one guy who was trying to bring it to America was running into wasn't about the audience. It was, the about, audience. it was about how do we fit advertising into it and we're going to put a Coca-Cola truck next yeah, to the car. I hated that idea. Yeah. I hated that idea. Yeah, so it's like, who's going to pay like, for this garbage? Do it. Like, I felt like, okay, do that. But, you know, <laughs> but... I, don't let me know about it. <laughs> yeah, I, I guess that's it. Yeah. <laughs> this is what I the mean. thing is, I'm down the road and you're going to see all kinds of... I was going to say, it's going to happen naturally. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There's no, billboards do, everywhere. No, what you do is you blur out anybody that, that would doesn't be pay you. Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> then you like reverse sick. advertise it. So it's like, well, <laughs> nobody's going to know whose truck that is unless you pay me. If you go here in Florida, all you're going to see is a bunch of lawyers. Morgan and Morgan <laughs> and Morgan and Morgan. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Don't get me started on that. Those billboards uh, for all these lawyers is yeah. so frustrating. We, we kind of have this though with like, you can, you can get like a giraffe cam at the zoo, right? Like, yeah. So this is kind of that they're just, we need more like of these like travel, I guess is like, no, yeah. and that is the thing because really it came down to, they were pointing to a specific, like, yeah, we don't have any of this on PBS. There's no slow TV mm-hmm. on PBS. That's mm-hmm. nationally broadcast to everybody, yeah. but with the internet, this is around, you yeah. can, you can find this where mm-hmm. they, they want to do this specifically. No point. Just kind of like experiential. And so I watched I, a little bit of I another one, which is drone footage of like just really beautiful mountainous areas mm. and some of it was in canada some of it was in maine some of it was in in the netherlands i believe so mm. it was you know there are things that are has anybody done this on an airplane like on a commercial flight put a camera pointing down so you can just like see the clouds and like you the probably stuff. have oh like that okay probably. not like in the cabin no because you'd I have mean, to like get the that's what i was wondering too though like are they getting releases for these people's faces and stuff? Like, especially kids. Like I in feel, Norway, you probably don't have yeah, to. Yeah, I bet Norway's different, but here it would be Because if you're shooting like in a mall or something, you you have to at least put up a sign that says like, by entering this area, which is all they'd have to do, I guess. But a lot of people in a private flight probably wouldn't want that or, mm, yeah. you know. But it is kind of weird because the, especially the in the Norway one, the reason the people were there is because they wanted to be on TV. Yeah. You oh, know? was it like not all of them though, right? Like it, a lot no, of them were just. Because these are, most of these places weren't just like, these were all just people just standing around. They were there because they knew the boat was coming. Oh, okay. And like hmm. they wanted to, you know, people had signs like, well, hey, grandma. That, you know? Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I'm sure there was some guy who was just trying to get to work and hated everything that was happening around him. But for the most part, I do think a lot of people just showed up to be on TV. Yeah. Because <laughs> they were There's- just watching where the stops were and they were trying to go catch one and be on, be a part. But that's the cool thing is kind of they all had this collective moment where they were all watching this on TV. And if you weren't watching it, you were waiting. And so you could go try and that's be on what, TV. That's what was so cool. It's like, it was just kind of like one, one moment in time type thing. I feel like it's not going to be replicated ever the same way. And it's just like, it was just one of those things that you hear about and it, it's gone now, but it was, it, it was a thing and it happened. Yeah. And it, I like that kind of stuff. It reminded me of, uh, Sigaros, the band mm-hmm. when they, when they returned to Iceland and they played all the little villages in Iceland 
and there's a documentary about it where everyone in the villages came out to these outdoor shows and it was like this the biggest event of like the, the rural Iceland ever because like, <laughs> they just went to all the little because usually you just play in Reykjavik or you know yeah. the two little towns there but yeah it just reminds me of that like everybody coming together for something and something kind of obscure but it's like big deal to them you know but yeah it yeah. definitely the a lot of the things they talked about was uh, really interesting and it's I don't know I don't know how it would work here on like a major broadcast side but yeah I mean I who knows I also really liked the way it they ended the podcast on uh, public broadcasting needs to be more funded. Yes. Because <laughs> I M- yeah. NPR is sick. It's great. Dude, it I is. just, well, I mean, and PBS in particular, but like, because, man, to think that this thing that no one really asked for <laughs> in, in no, Norway. Most of the time they're like, get it. Oh, you mean in Norway? Yeah, it's like something that nobody really asks for becomes an absolute sensation. And mm-hmm. it's like, we don't have that anymore here because everything goes through 10 bajillion meetings and pre-production and all this stuff. And it's like, if it's not going to make money, they don't, yeah, I was gonna they say, don't do mm-hmm. it. With the prerequisite of it has to make money. Yeah. And Which I mean, I, obviously it, that was not a factor. Well, I even yeah. found funny that... that the guy that was bringing it to America said that he licensed slow TV from the aid. And I was like, one, do you think he has to, or do you think he's like covering himself legally or what? Yeah. And one, do you think the Norwegian guy like had any ownership rights to the concept of putting a camera? On I would be TV? very curious because how, yeah, I was thinking about you? that too. Like how slow does it have to be for me to get copyright strike from Norway? You yeah. know, like how, how, how boring does this video have to be for us to just start <laughs> in, in, impeding on their IP? You know, I don't know. That's yeah. a weird I just, concept I thought to me. They glossed over it. I was just like, wait, what? Can you patent the idea of putting a camera I'm, on? I'm a, curious I didn't think about it until you mentioned it. I'm curious if you wanted to call it like slow TV America. Probably. Yeah, so then he like licensed the ability to call it that would be yeah. my guess. Because yeah, there is no way that they have like a patent <laughs> on putting a camera on a train. That seems too like yeah. too loose. <laughs> Can't yeah, of a thing. Well, before we stop, they asked a question at the beginning of this episode that I thought was a cool one and one that I couldn't really think of an immediate answer, but we can submit this to the show. Um, they asked, what is a friend or what is friendship? And so I was like thinking about that. And it's this once again, it's kind of a hard thing to nail down because I feel like there's like different groups of friends. You know, there's people that you like being around, but it's not like somebody you're going to tell your innermost secrets to or somebody that you're going to rely (laughs) on in like a supportive type of way and then there's like really close friends that are like with you and dealing with emotional things like that do you guys have any thoughts on what what a friend is who when they confirm it's when they they confirm on facebook and then oh yeah (laughs) yeah when when you when you we follow each other on twitter yeah Yeah, they give you a poke then they're a really good friend (laughs) (laughs) um no, that's a, it's a it's a complicated question because, like you said, there's different levels of friendship. You know, there's like you said, there's people that you trust implicitly to tell anything to. There's also people that are you would still consider friends that you don't really tell your deepest darkest secrets to because either you don't trust them because <laughs> they're the one you know you've got you know the friend the friend that you tell it something to and it's gonna be told to everybody yeah. whether they you know and um. You know, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. I've always... I think my, maybe I could boil it down to a friend, and I think this is a generalization for any friend, is someone you feel like you're comfortable enough to be yourself around all the time. Like, your authentic self. That works. I like that. Yeah. Yeah, I, and I, I kind of feel that, like you said, but to the different degrees of friends. So, like, maybe you have a friend for 15, 20 years, and you don't quite feel that way anymore or something. And like, you're still friends. Like, I feel like there are levels in that sense where you can not know someone that well, but when you do interact with them, you feel like you can be yourself. That's like, there's a certain depth to that, even though you've only known them for however many months or whatever, or you don't talk to them that much. I feel like that's the, <laughs> it's not, it's not always a time thing, I guess, in the, you know, for the, for the level of depth or comfort. I always think of it in terms of all the different things that I do is I'm like, oh, I have my music friends. I have my 
art friends, blah, blah, blah. But like the, the friends are the ones that can exist in all of them or none of them. You know, mm-hmm. no realm or all realms. Because I'm like, oh, cool. Like, I don't have to sit here and talk with about music with this guy because I also just like him, you know, or whatever. Oh, um, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you were talking about Billy, right? I'm your, I'm your ambient friend, uh, right? <laughs> not, oh, he has you in the category, <laughs> ambient. Right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, there's a great, I was watching 30 Rock and Ken, Kenneth, uh, what, what was the line he said? He said, uh, you're my best friend, Pete. In the bald slash uh, lonely category, <laughs> <laughs> and then he goes in. Right. Jack Donaghy's my best friend in the not bald and very strong category. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. But yeah, uh, no, I, I think that I agree with you guys. There's a lot of like nuance to it, but I feel like a friend is somebody that you want to give up, like because I feel like everybody has a finite amount of time, and who you spend that time with is uh, I feel like a pretty important decision. There's some things that are out of your control, work and things like that. And a friend is somebody that you will take your time and spend it with someone. And there's definitely levels of that. And there's definitely like complexities there. But really, I I feel like that is kind of all it is. But it's it's a weird thing to try Mm -hmm. and nail down because everybody's had friends, you know, their whole lives. But it's a weird thing to think like, what what is that? (laughs) Especially now when we feel like we know hundreds of people. Mm-hmm. at least like somewhat through the internet and stuff. And it's like, I sometimes maybe feel a little like I'm, I'm more of a friend to someone than I might not be, you know, if it came down to it, but mm-hmm. I don't know. Isn't that what they call like parasocial relationships and stuff? Like where you feel yeah. like, you know, someone like when I'm listening to you guys on the podcast and I'm like trying to chime in, but I'm going like, oh, <laughs> to, <laughs> Now I'm oh, here. you're I'm always like, welcome. <laughs> yeah, you are always welcome, buddy. <laughs> but I do know what you mean. Yeah, it it is. You listen, especially like podcasts or an audio book mm-hmm. or something, where you hear someone's voice for so long, and especially if they're, you know, genuine and kind of like it's a thing like this, where you're just like talking about something, mm-hmm. you feel like you know them. You've spent hours with this person, mm-hmm. and they have no idea who you are. Yeah. It is yeah. weird. It's a weird thing. Yeah, I just got to preface. This is a joke, but uh, Joe Rogan's my best friend. <laughs> <laughs> All right, but it was a great recommendation, Zach. It was fun yeah. to watch uh, yeah. hours and hours of this boat go through <laughs> these channels in Norway. Um, but now it's time for this week's recommendation. And I have an interesting one. I've listened to this show multiple times on multiple episodes, they have a lot of series. It's called Oh No, Ross and Carrie. And it's it's so good. They dive so deep into a topic, whether it be a religion or usually a little bit of a fringe thing, but they don't just talk about it. They go and they do it. So like they have like a seven or eight part series where they become Scientologists. (laughs) Uh, There's, there's a series where they become Satanists. Like they literally will go through the process of becoming a thing or being part of the thing, inducting the thing. And it's great. Like they go so deep into whatever they're talking about. Hmm. Um, And the episode that I want to recommend is Ono Ross and Carrie cool off with Wim Hof. Mm. Oh, okay. Three Wim Hof method. Okay. The Ice Bath Edition. I am right now Wait, reading his book, and it's 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 fascinating. It's fun. It's Dude, interesting. Wim Hof rules. I love Wim Hof. Wim Hof's awesome. Yeah, but uh, we will talk a lot about Wim Hof. We'll talk about what they experienced and what I am going to experience and experiencing right now doing the method because I'm doing I've it right been now. Doing it. <laughs> what? <laughs> his bottom half like, is in an ice bath <laughs> right yeah, now. I'm in an ice bath <laughs> this whole time. This method. What? I, I don't know what we're talking. You'll see. About. What am I not seeing in camera? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah that's oh no ross and carrie ross and carrie cool off with wim hof part three i love that title by the way cool off with wim so fun awesome um, the ice bath edition because they go to one of the seminars and they do it they do the ice bath thing and they have to learn how to do the breathing and all this other stuff it's it's great it's mm. really fun and uh yeah look forward to talking about that next week 
And remember, there's always more to discover.